Thank you for watching another Olympic Softworks Presents technical demonstration. All of these demonstrations focus on open source, Linux, cloud, networking, and IoT. In this episode, we will be talking about cloud images with special guest star, DHCP. So, when I say cloud images, I'm not talking about your normal cloud images like you had in the old days where you'd get a big silver thing that was kind of cool looking and you put it in the microwave and you irradiated your brother or your sister. It's a bad deal. Don't do that. So anyway, so those images were designed, the ISO image was designed to fit onto a, a immutable medium. The CD, DVD, whatever you have, even a, a thumb drive to some degree is immutable. It's not designed to be changed. It's designed to be used as is. A cloud image is not that way. A cloud image is a very lightweight. It is uh, sparse, <laughs> to, be, to be quite plain. Um, it's designed to be slightly altered to fit the need for mass production. We're also going to talk about what's in a DHCP. <laughs> There's a... The, the Discover packet, the first package that's sent, uh, is unique. Um, and we're going to go over that here. So, before we get too, too geeky in the front, let's just go ahead and get to the demo. Thank you very much, folks. Alrighty, so, today, on the docket, we've got a couple things to do. Two processes. The first process is going to be getting some cloud images, dealing with them, making them ready to import into a uh, Proxmox virtual environment. After that, we're going to use that image to make a template, and then we're going to verify that the template can be duplicated quickly. Um, cloud images are designed to be used in a virtual environment. Uh, they are an install image, like uh, if you're familiar with Linux or even Windows, you typically use an install media and you boot that on a host, on a computer or a laptop or something. It runs through a script and it goes from the media on which you have it to another form of media into the hard drive of the computer, essentially. So you start with an empty hard drive and a populated install media, and the install media runs and installs itself into the empty hard drive. Um, even if the hard drive isn't empty, it, it, it isn't empty. It, it installs into different partitions onto the hard drive. The whole point is that when you begin the process, the computer has no idea of what's going to go on, when the process is done, you still have the install media and its job has been done. In the computer, you have a brand new operating system or something like that. Cloud images are different. The cloud image, the file, is the essentially the media. There is no separate media required. Uh, that is a construct that isn't required in a virtual environment. If you want... 10 computers. You don't need 10 computers and 10 hard drives. You simply duplicate the file 10 times. Then you have 10 computers. Um, that's called cloning. So, to begin, where do we get it? How do we get it? And how do we use it? Let's uh, get our tools up here. There we go. So, where do we get it? We get it from the Ubuntu site. If you're doing uh, Ubuntu Linux, if you are doing Fedora Linux, there is a website for Fedora Cloud Images as well. Um, I'm sure there are others uh, for the other popular distributions. Not all distributions make a cloud image. Not at all. Um, but the ones who really purport their 
operating system as being a server operating system for a cloud uh, production environments and things, they will definitely have a cloud image. Um, now, the other question was how? So this is where. Now we go to how. How is pretty easy. We are going to... There we go. We're going to use just a standard wget. Okay? This is a webget, and then you use the address. If you wanted to do this, you literally could. Uh, focal, let's, as an example, let's go to focal. Uh, let's get the current image. And we go down here to the, the just the basic image, the shortest file name, dot .image. You don't want uh, Windows Subsystem for Linux or any of this other good stuff. Uh, you are not going to do, um, you know, we're doing x86, so we're 64-bit. Uh, we're not going to do, uh, as an example, ARM or something like that. So right-click, copy the link. It is as simple as pasting the link. Now, we're not actually going to do this. Um, I prepared some scripts. Um, when you do a, a, an operation uh, in the terminal again and again and again, it's best to make a script. Um, because if it's a project you're going to come back to later, you're probably going to have to look up flags again. And uh, if you've written a script that has a little bit of intelligence to it, it goes a long ways to making your life just easier. So what we're going to do here is we are going to do all right. So in uh, my originals folder, I've got a Fedora and a Jammy server. I do not have a um, a focal server. I wonder why. So what we're going to do is we're going to do. All right, this is the script I've got. Oh, okay. I will have the listings of the. Uh, there's there's very short scripts. Most of the scripting is actually just uh, checking for a, a variable and making sure that the variable is in a, a decent range to remind me what I needed to do with that script later on. Two weeks, three weeks, six months from now, if I try to use this again, I won't remember what I wanted to do. But because it reminds you, you uh, you can use it again quite easily. There we go. So we now have gotten the image. If you'll notice, it's not in the root of our current folder. It got tucked away into the originals folder. This is this is how I'm protecting these. These are the original unmanipulated files directly from um, Canonical. Now, um, we pulled, the, the script that I used, pulled the recent, the current version of whatever I asked for. Now, I asked for foc uh, Focal, so it went to the current. Current is probably, uh, current is the same one as this one. Um, as an example, Watch this. So let's go to, uh, it won't matter here. So let's do this. All right. So we have Jammy has a file length of this. Okay. Now watch this. What's going to happen is it's going to grab the current version of Jammy, which I'm positive will be different. Uh, well, yeah, absolutely. I didn't download the other one since, or I haven't since December 1st. This is December 15th now as I record this. 16th now as I record this. So I'm positive that this will be different. This is important. Um, normally, when you have an install, uh, of uh, uh, an operating system. You need to update that installation. And that's not really how servers work because a lot of times the servers are spun up as needed. So what you do is you'll have a, uh, a template ready to go and that template needs to be up to date 
because at any time you might need to spin up 3, 30, 40, 100 different servers to do different jobs um, for scaling and bursting and, and the hybrid cloud, all that good stuff. So you don't want to be updating 100 different servers and keeping them running and then starting. It, it just doesn't work. So the way cloud images work, you get the most current image, you use that, you set your templates off of that, and then from time to time, you go out and grab the new most current image, and you make that your new template. And that's how that works. Um, you don't install things in the cloud quite like you do everywhere else. That's what cloud technology is about. It's kind of hard to wrap your mind around, but it's really cool once you do. So let's go ahead and take a look at this. We have the original 9872-1280, December 14th. So they are very different. So this one, this version of Jammy was created uh, two days ago. The version of Focal we downloaded was created three days ago. And it, this was more current than the one I downloaded 14 days ago. They keep these pretty much, they say that's nightly, but it's probably like two or three, four times a week. Um, unless they get a, a critical patch, then it's probably within the hour as soon as that patch is done. Um, that's another bonus of doing your cloud images instead of a standard install image type. When you download these, you get an up-to-date image that has all of the patches right now right down to the kernel level patch. You don't have to install anything, whether it's there. This is this is what uh, Ubuntu is trying to sell, Canonical is trying to sell to people uh, to use in major enterprises. So they're going to really put a lot of effort into keeping this up to date. This is a hell of a resource for cloud um, enthusiasts like myself. And if you're watching this video, like you too. So let's go back here to what we were doing. Okay. We are going to use the next script. The next process in this is to use vert customize to add the guest agent to the cloud image. Let me do it this way. All right. It's going to remind me one argument condition the focal image. Now what it's going to do is the script is going to grab the image from the originals folder, drag it out into the root of the of the directory. It will then manipulate that. The first thing it will do is update the image to also have the QEMU guest agent attached to it so that when the image is installed and, and booted, the QEMU guest agent is already present. We don't need to do anything with it. Also, this image by default, once it is uncompressed, it starts out at under a gig. Once it's uncompressed, it'll be about 2.2, 2.3 gigs. That's great that it's so small to ship and to store and that, uh, you know, when you popcorn it out, it, 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 it gets to its, its original, its full size. However, we're actually going to be adding some software to this. So the 2.3 gigs is all used. That's the size of the volume as you get it. It has no space in the volume. Normally this, in a, in a typical installation, you would install this into a 60 gig hard drive and then you would have the balance left for you. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this and this script tells that image when it gets decompressed to continue decompressing so that it has essentially, in a virtual way, a 32 gigabyte hard drive, essentially. Of course, it's a QCOW image, so it won't be the full 32 gigs. It'll just be what's used. But the software inside, the file system, will know that this is a 32 gigabyte image, or it can be, and it can continue to add to it. And the, the physical image that we maintain will grow only as needed. Again, that is another feature that's great for cloud images. Why through a 60 gig hard drive or a 32 gig hard drive? A lot of people use 32 for uh, Linux servers, uh, 60 for Windows. Um, why would you throw 32 gigs at every single server you're going to run when you might only have four to five gigs of operating system and, and hard and software loaded into it? That's a hell of a waste. So 
here we are. We now have, if we look at this, our image is now currently 9.8032. And you'll see that the actual focal image. So it is now 9 gigs, or 0.9 of a gig, 900 megabytes. It used to be 600 megabytes. So what we did is we added the QEMU guest agent and just a little bit else. We resized, we resized the server, the, the image, so the actual foundation image, the file, is actually almost a full gig now when it started out as basically two-thirds of a gig. That is what it is. Next, we import. So let's keep up with this here. We have where. We've done that. We've done how. And now, and we've used the script the whole time. Okay, so this is we've gotten the image. Now modify the image. We have gone over how cloud images are different. Cloud init. Okay, we did cloud virtualize. Not really. We did the goal. Okay, we need to go over cloud init. So, let's go ahead and add a virtual machine to the Proxmox virtual environment. Now, I've watched a lot of videos on this trying to figure out where the, the, the general home labbing um, community is on this kind of thing. Um, to be clear, I'm a recent graduate of college. Uh, I've got a, a, a bachelor's in uh, computer science now, network operations and security. Uh, I've got some certs. So I'm looking at, I'm a home labber myself, of course, and I'm, I'm trying to find out where the majority of people out there are who haven't gone through a, a college for this. People think this the, the VM's got to be around 9,000 to do this. It doesn't matter. This is a virtual machine that we're going to create. We're going to create a virtual machine from in a different kind of image, but it's still a virtual machine image. It's going to be a dot, um, I believe it's a dot raw when it's done instead of a, a QCOW, but it, same kind of a, a thing. So we're going to set this to ID 400 just because I like keeping the numbers down. I usually use over a thousand for actual running servers, under a thousand are where I keep my um, install images, where I keep my test images. So we're going to call this Ubuntu 20.04 and we're going to call it Cloud Test 1A. Okay. Operating system. We don't want any media. We're not going to boot off of a CD drive or a thumb drive to install an operating system because that's not how this works. Linux kernel? Correct. And I can't wait for 6.0 to come out on this. Um, okay, graphics card. Here's the deal. Cloud images do not use hardware graphics cards. They know a, a cloud image is designed to be used in a virtual environment. That is how the thing works. A terminal is just uh, an input and output of letters. So the virtual terminal that we're going to use here is going to be connected to serial terminal zero. Uh, it's, a, it's not, of course, it's a virtual serial terminal, but if you're of a certain age, you might remember having computers that were sold to you with a RS-232 serial terminal on the computer. And you could actually use that in the old days to do things, useful things, without a video card. Imagine that. We're back to those days. Click the QEMU agent. You don't need to change the BIOS. This is Linux, so you can use standard BIOS. You don't need anything tricky. You don't need a TPM. We're going to get rid of the hard drive that the machine wants to give us. Typically, it tries to hook up, a, hook us up with a SCSI drive. We don't need the drive. It will add a SCSI device that we can add our drive to later for us. It will all be ready for us. We don't need anything to, uh, ready to go. Now, I like uh, three cores. I like four gigs. The performant um, option here is the vert IO para virtualized. Everything else can stay the same. Now. 
in the future, we, I will be messing with this, and, and we're going to get into that. But for, the, for, for a base install, you do not need to change this. As a matter of fact, I don't actually recommend it unless you have a specific reason to set a MAC address. Uh, in a home lab, even in, in, a, in a regular lab, you don't really need to do that. It, it, they're randomized enough. They're fine. You can always find them and, and fix that if you need to. So we are set. Now, do not start it after it's created. It won't even if you tried because it cannot boot. It cannot boot because it has no software. It has nothing. It has no instructions. It has a CD drive, which we asked it not to give us. Isn't that nice? There's our SCSI controller. And now we're going to add what's called a cloud init drive. Now, the images that come from Canonical for the Ubuntu operating system, the images that come from Fedora for the Fedora operating system, from Red Hat, any cloud image is going to have some drawbacks. Those drawbacks are the fact that it is a base image designed to be manipulated to some degree to fit the needs of the enterprise using it. Now, it's a big word way of saying it doesn't boot by default. It can't. You have to tell it how you want it to boot. Do you want to use DHCP? Do you want to set a, a custom IP? Um, what user do you want? It's not going to have a default user. That would be totally insecure. Every single volume <laughs> that's ever downloaded would be insecure by nature um, because a lot of these systems are exposed to the Internet as soon as they're running. Now, you, you, that could be manipulated later, but so there's, they, they're sold without a user. There's no root, at least on the Ubuntu ones. There's no root. There's no root password. There's a root user, of course, but no root password, so you can't log into the root user, and there's no other user. Furthermore, you can't use password authentication to log into one of these things via SSH or remotely. The only way to get into the thing, if you have to, right off the bat, is through the terminal in the Proxmox VE, which, of course, uh, emulates you standing in front of a server rack with a laptop plugged into a port, reading the port. So what we're going to do now is we're actually going to get this back up. There we go. Okay. Focal, and we've got this at 400, and I want this to go into vSpace. So vSpace is my virtual space where I have all of my VMs running. That's a uh, array of SAS drives. It's a mirrored array, so I have one terabyte that's mirrored. So there's two one-terabyte drives that are mirrored. It's quite fast. It's quite reliable. So that's where I put my stuff. So we're going to go ahead and import. Now watch this here. There is, there's nothing, oh, I got uh, sidetracked here. We have no cloud init here. Now, we could do this now. We could do this later. I like to do this now because typically when you set up the VM, you can take care of the cloud init. You go to hardware, add, cloud init drive. It's not a real drive. Don't worry about it. We're going to put this into the space where we're, where we're going to put our actual VM, okay? This is the VM image. This is the hard drive that we're going to load into our virtual machine. And we're going to set this for IDE 0. That's what I've been, uh, been led to understand is the best way to do this. And there we go. Now you'll notice when I went into Cloud Init earlier, this would not come up because I had not yet instituted, initialized the Cloud Init. What this really is is a manifest. It's not a real drive. It's a, it's a, it's a document. It's a manifest. It's a YAML file. Um, I think it's YAML. It's a YAML file that contains a set of instructions for the cloud init subsystem to do when the image is installed. So the way these things work, the cloud image installs itself it pretty much already is installed when you download it. The, the image you have is the pre-installed image, more or less. 
there is a little bit of installation work that gets done, but not much. You'll notice because it doesn't ask you any questions. It doesn't ask you for a username or a password or a time zone or anything. You're supposed to already have that instituted via the cloud init. So we're going to set this up. Cloud init, we're accessing that manifest here now. We're going to set up a default username. Okay, good. A default password. Now this will only work in the terminal here at the Proxmox uh, UI, which of course in enterprise <clears throat> isn't going to work. When you're a tech and you've got to spin up 30, 30 uh, of these things, that's not going to be sufficient. You're going to need to automate that. Username and password won't cut it. So we're going to be using a public key, but we're not going to do that right now. I just wanted to kind of, as we go through this, why we're doing this. Now, a lot of people like to use DHCP. The idea is that you can set up a DHCP lease on your router or whatever you're using to provide you with a DHCP service. You're using a, um, a Raspberry Pi, a Pi Hole to do your DHCP. It could be any number of things. Um, the problem with that is when this machine comes up, you don't know what the Mac is. You can tell it a Mac when you're setting it up on the other side, but when you're cloning things, you really can't set that Mac um, and then you've got you would have to then go to the router and and have the router understand the Mac you do, the Mac you just did it. You, there's a whole lot to it. It's much. I, I used to be in that camp myself. It is so much simpler to just use a static IP. Let's do that one. That's nice. Oh, we've got to do a CIDR notation. We are using the first 24 bits as a network. And gateway is standard. It's not a LAS gateway at 254. Sorry, LAS. And uh, we'll use this, uh, leave this off. If it's static and there's nothing set, it will be off by default. It won't, uh, I, I don't think it will actually be present in the manifest at all. So we now have this set up. We could set up the domain and servers instead of waiting for that to percolate through with DHCP. We could do a whole kind of things. There actually is a way to access the rest of this manifest. But for the most part, in the Proxmox environment as a lab tool, this is more than sufficient for us. So we are almost ready. Watch this. Okay, percolates up into 32 gigs, and it should pop over here. Oh, we're in hardware. There we go. There it is, right there. In the wrong uh, tab there. So, this is an unused disk. What we do is double click. The only thing you can do with it, because it's a brand new thing to the VM, it's a brand new object, you have to add it. Before you can, you know, this is manipulating, You could we could tell it what we want. If we knew that we were doing this with uh, uh, STDs, we could uh, do this card for trim. We could do some other things here. I've heard that write back uh, actually and disk card makes this more performant. Don't really care about that in this one here. This is more than performant enough. There we go. We now have a full computer loadout here. We've got a proc, we've got memory, we've got a display, we've got uh, a subsystem here, we've got storage, we've got networking, we're good to go. But it won't boot still because we haven't told it how to boot. We have to tell it to boot from the SCSI drive, like that. Now it's ready to boot. Now let's go into the console. Yeah, let's go into the console. Occasionally, when this starts up, you won't necessarily see the uh, the boot order. Uh, remember, it's coming out as a uh, a stream, and I think there is a uh, a race condition or something that exists 
I just do this to make sure it is firing up. You, you know, uh, th this is all labbing. This is still getting uh, accustomed to how all this is set up to go. And, uh, yeah, this still isn't updating. See, it sounds like now when we got to check, no, display is going out to serial terminal. Everything should be fine. We should see a whole lot of crap spewing out here. If you've ever installed Linux, you know what I'm talking about. Let's give it a couple seconds here. When the uh, install process gets to the point where a user is ready to log in, the cloud init um, system takes over and finishes the boot and does a few things. Well, we have an IP. We just have zero output here. Oh, we're already up. Okay. Everything looks good. Now, here's the thing. So we're able to log in here. Now watch this. Remember that we set this up for one, two, three, right? So. There we go. We are up and running. But. Not gonna happen. Not today. And the reason is because we don't have a public key. Period. Cloud images are designed to be hardened. They're designed to be expo exposed to the internet directly. Um, all patches, um, all the crypto, the, 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 the modern number of bits to be considered secure uh, according to uh, modern best practices are all instituted on these cloud images. Um, that is their purpose. That's what they're set up for. Part of that is to minimize uh, your attack surfaces, your exposure. And username logins is a huge, huge vulnerability. If you simply eliminate username logins, then a whole lot of password um, hacking can't happen because that's not how things work. So how do you get around this? Well, quite easy. So let's go ahead and shut this down. Uh, let's do it the old-fashioned way. Okay. So we are going to set up cloud in it. We're going to give it a public key. That is the public key currently being used by SSH on this system. Um, now, if you're going to do this from a lot of machines, and you'll have to do some key management. Uh, I'm doing this from one key, from one machine, into a server so I can just repeat this key wherever I need to go. And from this server, I will always be able to log in where I need to. What if you need to do this? How do you do this? So, is it keygen? Yes, and it would be type RSA and bits is 307, 3072, I believe is the current number of bits recommended to be secure. Now, the RSA is an old, old algorithm. It's an old method, but it is the method that all versions of SSH currently supported um, work with. There are better methods, there are more secure um, algorithms, uh, but they're not supported by all versions of SSH. 
And in my lab, I have a lot of older machinery, old Cisco machinery that uh, I have to even go down to uh, in insecure key exchanges because they're they're so old and they they can't get the modern uh, updates. So RSA is what I use everywhere. If you're doing this kind of a thing, you, that's going to be similar for you. As long as you stay with 3072 bits or even higher, 4096 is even better. Um, of course, it, this doesn't matter for actual commu actual communication. This is just to create the symmetrical key that's used to to facilitate fast traffic back and forth along this uh, SSH bridge. So here we go. Yes, uh, go ahead and overwrite the existing uh, passphrase. Always recommended to have a passphrase, not a password, a passphrase. Um, Good password hygiene is important. Now, in this case, this is a lab, so I'm using a very short passphrase, essentially a password. Um, but again, this is just, uh, don't do this in production. All right. So what we're going to do, let's cat that again. We're going to take this, just copy pasta, right into here. Bang. Now we could also do it the old-fashioned, or you know, the 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 chic way. But uh, it's important to understand, uh, and to be real clear, this is the window here that is representing the terminal on on the server. This is the terminal here on my workstation. This is the public key in my current workstation that I'm going to use to log in to this server here. So now we have this. Now let's go ahead and reboot this. There we go. See, it works this time. And I'm just going to wait for it to get done. There we go. So, there we go. Ha! Notice the key changed. So, my local machine had a had a communication going with the remote server and it knew that you know the remote server in my machine uh, could communicate but I had no public key to give it I got a key back from it but I had nothing to give uh, is the best way to understand um, in this exchange of, of keys so when I remade my key using the SSH key gen it uh, probably changed a whole bunch of things so now it's saying no Dave that's a uh, the, the way it looks now is not the way it looked before. Somebody might be screwing with you. And uh, in this case, they're not. We're just uh, trying to get by here. And... And there we go. Boom. That's it. So, once we typed in, now, uh, I believe, uh, every time. Okay. So, now we can log in remotely. Why is this done? This is one of the effects of uh, a cloud image, one of the differences of cloud, uh, a cloud image. And in order to do this and have this work, we need to have the cloud init system design, uh, built up for us. Now remember, cloud init, this isn't really another drive or anything that we made. It's, it, it's called a drive in the Proxmox GUI, but it's really just a, a, a document. It's a manifest of some data points that we want to pass to the cloud init subsystem when it runs. So here we go. So let's see how we're doing here. We've got cloud init. 
We're going to do vert customize and the policy. Okay. Vert customize. One of the five commands that are enabling us to do all of this um, is vert customize. Now, in order to run vert customize, uh, to use this command, there's uh, some more libraries that need to be uh, loaded into the machine, and I believe there's a, f a couple more uh, groups that are created. So it may affect your threat surface. It may not. Um, I'm not a security researcher. I'm a network security guy, not a machine security guy. So I'm not sure how that would affect uh, a machine. But having said that, what it allows you to do is to take a raw image and essentially using a package manager-like feature, you can simply install packages into the cloud image so that when that cloud image is uh, cloned out to, to do a job, you, have, you can have whatever code you need pre-installed into that ready to go for your templates. Everything that we're doing here is, is pushing towards creation of templates. Um, you'll see how that works in just a little bit. And the policy going forward, well, that was it. So the idea of a cloud image, you, you get the cloud image. It's a base image. It's the kernel. It's enough of the operating system to get the thing up and running and have you put whatever you want being the cloud administrator into that image to run for whatever purpose you're going to use that image, that template for. Um, we are ready to go here now. We've imported. We've made a VM. OK. Now we're actually going to do some experimentation. So I'm going to end this video here. The next video is going to take up where this one leaves off. Recap. We took an image. We, in, we, we downloaded it. We saved it. We modified it. We imported it. Started it. Verified it. So we now have a... essentially a 32 gig hard drive, um, a 32 gig system here, okay? Um, and remember, these, this is a, a VM. So it, think of it functionally as a computer, but really this is just a collection of data. Um, everything here is a manifest that is maintained by the virtual environment system. The hard drive and this hard drive are actual files that are maintained separately. But all the rest of this is a just a simple manifest maintained in a very small file. So when we clone this, the clones are not a full machine. And this 32 gig here isn't a full 32 gigs. The actual space, if we were to look at this, is probably like 3 gigs tops. The 2.2, 2.3 gigs that it uh, was when it began, um, after it popcorned out and got decompressed, um, plus probably some, some, some pointers and some other things, some libraries maybe, um, once it all booted up. and you know, it, But it thinks it has 32 gigs of space, which is the important part. So if we need to install more applications, um, some libraries, something else to get it running, we have plenty of room. All right. Have a great day, folks. Um, stick around for the rest of this. What we're going to do now is uh, do some testing. We're going to create four clones from the import function that I created. Then we're going to create four clones from just cloning within here. And we're going to make sure that all of the machine IDs are different, that the IPs are coming out correct, and that uh, we have different MAC addresses. And then we're just going to make a template. Uh, so basically, we are moving from the cloud image portion of this from the the, the hard-coded uh, terminal work everything from here on out is pretty much going to be done in Proxmox um, just looking up some things we're not going to do any uh, a lot of hardcore um, 
criminal work anymore. Just, just going to be uh, looking at some files. All right. Have a great day, folks.